Je voudrais parler en français, mais mon gouvernement l'a rendu illégal de parler dans une langue européenne. I'm from London, which is in Europe. I'm David. And I spend um, most of my time with the crazy people trying to build the future, the entrepreneurs, the researchers in the university, the venture capitalists who are putting money into things that don't yet exist. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how quickly things are changing and why none of us is safe. I'm from the world of media. I set up a magazine with lovely two-dimensional pictures. And then a few days ago, some researchers in Russia showed that they could take any two-dimensional picture, including some famous ones, and turn them into a three-dimensional video using forms of deep learning. So now you can see what Mona Lisa taking a selfie would have been like. Um, if artificial intelligence is now deciding what creativity is, this kind of changes some of the rules. There's um, every day some new barrier being overcome. Um, the chip maker NVIDIA recently showed how to turn anybody into a kind of a realistic portrait artist. You start on the left with making some very, very broad brush strokes, and the machine, because it's got the database of every other kind of image, finishes it for you. We had, again, only a few days ago, a five or six euro algorithm that could make a UN-style speech and still send people to sleep, but as effectively as the original. We are in the world now of deep fakes, where you can simulate fake news in a video without any effort. It's becoming commodified. How about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things. But anybody can. So what does this mean for political debate in the future? It gets interesting. Um, we have a pretty famous footballer in the UK who's not famous for being very, very verbally articulate, but suddenly you can show him speaking in multiple languages. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. بريون ميرون تان مريض كوي وما زال تقتل طفلا كل دقيقتين من بوفوز ميتفا This is a startup in London that did this a low funded startup so um I set up and for 8 years was running the UK edition of Wired and I kept meeting the people building this future and doing what I thought was amazing reinvention of industries and I thought a lot about what proper innovation was. Um, my friend Daniel in Germany just showed a couple of weeks ago that his vertical takeoff electric jet could actually take off. This is a company called Lilium. This is one of a whole bunch of startups remaking the aviation space. There's a drone company that's just had a valuation of more than a billion dollars. It's called Zipline. It's using drones to solve a real problem, taking medical supplies and blood into places like Rwanda, where it's really hard to get through on the road. There's a company in San Francisco giving us 360 degree of our planet, visibility of our planet, because it's got a network of hundreds of satellites tracking what's happening in real time. So suddenly, things that people didn't want you to see, let's say Apple, quite a secretive company when it was building its Cupertino campus, this company, Planet, allows you to subscribe to their feed and to see. So we have new layers of visibility about what's happening in agricultural land. The thing is, a company will reveal something new. Amazon, about three years ago, revealed its concept store with no cash register because it knows when you're taking things off the shelf. It's got computer vision. It's got sensors tracking you. You've scanned your phone to go in the store. Other retailers kind of dismissed it as a gimmick. And then last year, Amazon says we're going to open 3,000 of these stores in the US. It re recently opened one in New York. 
And suddenly, if you're asking people to stop and pay, well, you're putting friction in their way. You become a less competitive retailer. If you're offering customer service through email and people have to wait 24 hours for a response, well, that makes no sense in the era of real-time smart responses. There's a company in New Zealand called Soul Machines that's making these CGI characters. These are not videos of people that respond to the audio and video of you talking, and they customize the response. Yes. No. No. Maybe. And they do it Goodbye. in multiple languages. Willkommen in Deutschland. So this is a company not started by a customer service specialist, started by a guy who won a couple of Oscars for doing CGI in Hollywood, in movies like Kong. And then he starts to learn about neuroscience. His name's Mark Sagar. It's often the outsider who comes in and rethinks how things are done. So why does this matter? Because you keep having to renew if you're in retail, if you're in media, if you're in medical device manufacturer. You can't do what you did last year because very quickly it's becoming irrelevant. And so every organization is looking for this thing called innovation. It's become a mystical cult. It's become magic. And yet often we're not thinking about what innovation actually is and we're wasting our energy in fake innovation, in gimmicks, in showing off that we've got some incremental change without thinking about whether it's actually useful. The biggest tech convention every year in January is the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Hundreds of thousands of people looking for the latest innovations. And they get lots of media coverage. They get celebrated. Innovations like this, which I'm not sure the world actually needs. Actually got worse this January. Um, this January, some of the great innovations coming out of CES included the bottle opener that notifies your friends each time you have a new beer. If you're one of those people who um, is obsessed with how often your cat is pooping, so the online internet of things, cat litter toilet, this was this year. The problem is quite a lot of serious money goes into this fake innovation. Um, there was a company that raised $120 million from quite a lot of big venture capitalists, including Google Ventures, that was making a juicing machine connected to the internet, claiming to be the world's smartest juicing machine. Um, the company was called Juiceru. The machine itself started at $700. It had Bluetooth and internet connectivity and lots of sensors. You had to buy these refillable sachets that it then turned into the perfect smoothie, which went great until some journalists at Bloomberg realized they could take the sachets and squeeze them in their hands, and they got just as good juice, but actually faster. <laughs> Sadly, Juicero then goes out of business, having blown through $120 million. Um, this company raised $180 million before going out of business. It was called Quirky. It took ideas from the crowd, great innovations that you might have had an idea for in the shower, and then it goes and makes them and sells them. So one of their products was the smart milk jug called the Milk Maid, which had sensors in that could tell when your milk was starting to go sour and then would send you urgent notifications so you would cancel your business trip or you know, go back from the office early. They go bust, but again, not before issuing the $50 smart egg tray, if you're one of these people who gets very, very worried about when your eggs are starting to go bad, this has like LED lights to indicate the oldest egg. Anyway, quirky, sadly, goes out of it. But every day I'm seeing new investment money going into, in the drone world, ProDrone, the first drone with robot arms, innovation. And I'm thinking, is this now the way to take your kids to school? <laughs> or because technology always has a dark side, is this now the way to abduct kids from school? And I'm at the stage now where I can't often tell the difference between a real innovation that's grabbing our attention or a fake innovation. Um, I don't know if you saw this. This is the, the spoon. If you're one of those people who's so busy Instagramming and messaging that you don't really want to stop for lunch, this got quite a lot of media coverage last year. 
I couldn't tell if this was a genuine product. It turned, I looked into it. It turned out to be um, made by a media agency, so I think they were doing it to get the coverage. So they won. Um, but then people are paying real money for stuff like this. On Kickstarter, this raised $18,000, and it's called the No Phone. And it pitched itself as having all the advantages that your smartphone doesn't. It doesn't run out of battery. It uh, doesn't interrupt you with notifications when you don't want to see them. It's actually a piece of slate. But 915 people thought this was cool. I guess it's innovation. Although the Chinese are probably winning the innovation race. I don't know if you um, have one of those health insurance policies that gives you a discount if you connect the data so it can tell how many steps you've taken that day. Maybe this is innovation. Um, so why am I telling you this? Because there's real stuff happening. Because, you know, <laughs> these exponential curves are changing everything. Stuff that was expensive goes down to free, and that changes the rules for everybody. But if you're in business, if you're running a bureaucracy, the kind of incentive is to stay doing what you were doing because you're comfortable. And yet, these curves are hitting everything. This is the falling cost of batteries. So if you are making an internal combustion engine, forget government subsidizing the electric car. The market's doing it. It was $1,000 per kilowatt hour at the start of the decade. In the next 10 years or so, it's forecast to go down to 70. If you are sequencing DNA, if you're in medicine, this is a logarithmic scale, the falling cost of sequencing, the green curve falling more quickly than Moore's law. At the start of the century, $100 million to sequence a person, heading towards just a couple of dollars. You keep seeing these curves everywhere. Mary Meeker runs an annual trends, internet trends report. She published it last week. This is one of the slides on Mary Meeker's internet report. This is the number of hours American adults spend on their digital screens. The um, green is the mobile, the gray is the desktop laptop, the blue is every other connected device. Look, over the last decade, we've gone from 2.7 hours to more than double to 6.3 hours. This is time you are not spending talking to your colleagues or your children or reading a physical book or magazine. This is time you are on a screen. It's changing the nature of business. It means suddenly you've got billionaires who don't have an infrastructure for their cosmetics company. So Kylie's company doesn't make it. She outsources the manufacturing and the packaging to a company called Seed Beauty. Shopify, the online merchant, does the sales and fulfillment. Her mother does her PR. It's a new era where people come from nowhere to dominate a big industry. Every company is having to be a machine learning company, an artificial intelligence company. McDonald's just spent $300 million acquiring an Israeli company to be a smart data machine learning company. And this is the new reality. This is the home page of a bank that's been annotated by CB Insights to show for every link on the home page some of the startups taking that lunch away. Foreign currency transactions, loans, insurance. So how do you respond? So the popular response at the moment is, well, let's have a startup unit. Let's have an incubator, an accelerator. A yogurt company now has a startup incubator. People who make airplanes have a startup incubator. I travel on a lot of airplanes, and this kind of worries me. Um, often, they don't achieve anything. It's tick the box. We've done the startup thing. It's corporate innovation theater. It's not fundamentally changing the culture of an organization so it can use technology to go where demand, where customer behavior is going. Because the short-term incentives are the market wants us to keep making what we're making. And we have people and legacy systems who are fixed in their approach. And I often think about the Roadrunner cartoon when he chases Wiley Coyote off the cliff and the coyote only falls when he looks down and realizes he hasn't been on solid ground for a while. So I was doing a lot of talking to corporate executives who were convinced that they had innovation sorted because they had a director 
of innovation, or a chief disruptive growth officer, or the titles got better and better, a digital Sherpa, and that was going to solve the problem. And I'm a journalist, so I'm kind of skeptical. And I said, so what have you achieved? Oh, nothing yet. It's early, but we're going to get there. And I thought, this is not enough. The fundamental shifts are too big just to be relaxed. You need to take charge. You need to reinvent whatever your organization is to be fit for tomorrow. And you need to do it quickly. So I decided to go and look for examples of people who were doing it properly, who were actually quite inspiring, so I could share their stories. Um, and I ended up going to 20 countries. Um, and I published a book three weeks ago um, with Penguin in the UK. And as I started looking for the non-bullshit innovation, I discovered there's an organization called the International, Organiza the International Association of Innovation Professionals. And it made me realize there are so many people selling services, consulting services, that they are innovation professionals. They can transform your business. I thought, this makes even less sense. I went to their annual convention in Washington, D.C., just to see what it was like. It's called InnovaCon. And the guy running the convention takes me aside in the cocktail reception and says, do you want to know the science of innovation? I said, I didn't think there was a science. I thought it was messy and organic and human. He said, no, I will draw you on a napkin, the science of innovation. He got this napkin, drew three circles, hard science, social science and business, and that mysterious bit in the middle, he said, is where real innovation happens. And it's a repeatable scientific formula. And I know many of you are scientists and mathematicians and... I don't think this is a repeatable formula. So I'll tell you what I learned that I don't think is a scientific formula. Um, I'll share with you 10 approaches to transformation that do seem to deliver results, because I think they're translatable to other types of organization. Um, and the first one is pretty universally applicable. Innovation is not about the people at the top. Hierarchy no longer works. You need to empower people all the way through an organization because they're the ones who see the changing behaviors. They're the ones who have the ideas, who can challenge existing thinking. Um, Ilka Panonen runs probably Europe's most successful games company in Finland. You've played some of the games. This company is called Supercell, and it's so-called because it's cells of autonomous units, and the Supercell is the entirety of cells, and you can choose, if you're working there, which cell you work in. You can move to a different cell if you're not excited about something. And he talks about Ilka wanting to be the world's least powerful CEO, because he said, it's not about me, it's about getting talented people, making them feel they can do their best work if they control how and what they work on. I went to their office in Helsinki. I met a guy called Jonathan Downey, who'd led a team of 10 people making a new game over about a year. Very expensive salaries, very the, the best in the world. And they tested the game on the Canadian app store, the Australian app. It wasn't getting the engagement that they wanted. And they were getting a bit frustrated. And because this is Finland, he calls them to go to a sauna, a group sauna, and they start talking about what they're really excited about, which wasn't this game. So they get back to the office. He sends an email to the whole company saying, hey, guys, we're canceling the game. Sorry about the wasted money. We're all going to work on other projects now. And they didn't tell the boss because he wasn't in the office at that moment. But that's how he wanted it. So if you can find a way to give your team a sense of ownership, it gets pretty transformative. There's a hotel in an expensive area of London called Claridge's. For 10 years, they wanted to build a basement, actually five levels of basement. And the owners had two rules. First of all, he didn't want to shut the hotel because they didn't want to lose the clients. And secondly, the only way that the builders could get things in and out was one window, two meters by two meters at the back. And for 10 years, every engineering company and building company said, this is not possible. This is the impossible basement project. You can't dig under a hotel and keep it open. Until they invited a London-based team of consulting engineers 
owned by the staff. Arup has 15,000 engineers around the world working on the toughest skyscrapers and bridges. They decide what they work on. And after everybody else had said, this can't be done, a couple of Arab people went in there and thought, this is a really interesting intellectual challenge. I wonder if we can kind of ask around ourselves if there's a way people can think of solving this. And they took on the project, and they thought, why don't we bring in some miners from Ireland to hand dig, just like in a coal mine. They started digging 30-meter-long tunnels, vertical tunnels. They did 61 of them. They filled them with concrete, took all the mud out of the little window at the back. When they had 61 concrete pillars, they floated the hotel on top, and then they started digging. In February, they completed the fifth underground floor that everybody said was impossible because they allowed people to be independent and think about what they wanted to do. So another approach in a world where products are being commodified, anybody can get access to crowdfunding or cloud computing. Anybody can get access to cheap manufacturing in Shenzhen. How do you differentiate? So increasingly, it's not selling a product, it's selling a service layer. There's a bookshop, again, in an expensive part of London that's been there since 1936, and they were losing money because how do you compete with Amazon? Hayward Hill Books is an institution, and the guy who took it over about seven years ago, Nicky Dunn, thought the only way we're going to survive is by reframing how we think of ourselves. We can never compete as experts in selling books. What if we became experts in curating books? What if we started offering a personalized library building service? The first customer, a wealthy woman from Switzerland, wanted 3,000 books for her mountain chalet on modernism. They charged her 600,000 euros. They're now doing very expensive libraries. Then they thought, what about our customers, we can personalize our relationship with them. We can create a subscription service. We have five or six ladies in the basement who read a couple of hundred books a year. They can choose a book for you. They now have thousands of people paying 500 euros a year to have each month one book selected for them, gift wrapped and sent through the post. It's now making a load of money, this bookshop, because they're now selling the human decision algorithm there's a bank in Finland, the biggest retail bank in Finland, Oppa. It's more than 100 years old. It saw this tsunami of change coming. It was losing out to startups. It knew 10% of its profits that it was making from lending money for people to buy cars was going to obliterate because 10 or 15 years later, we won't buy cars, we'll buy access to the electric network of autonomous cars. What do they do? Well, they thought selling products, challenging. We have trust. People trust us to help them get them through difficult bits of their life, buying a house, starting a business. Why don't we help them become healthy? They've built five hospitals now in Finland. The bank operates hospitals where they perform surgery. Highly efficient hospitals, because they started from zero. If you need a scan that afternoon, you've broken a leg, get it straight away. If you need surgery, you get it the next morning. Because it's so efficient, the health insurance product is actually really cheap, and it's growing incredibly fast. In the new world, it's no longer enough to think of yourself in isolation running your organization. It's much more effective to partner in a way that's mutually beneficial. Um, I went to China to tell a story about this man, Lei Jun, who set up a company that makes smartphones. Um, one of the leading smartphone companies in China is called Xiaomi. And he's often been accused of ripping off Apple, but they're very high-end phones, very, very cheap. They make no margin on the phones because it's such a competitive market. And he did make the mistake of wearing the black turtleneck once at a keynote and using the phrase, one more thing. And I'm not going to comment on what the Xiaomi stores may look like, but there's something really innovative they're doing. 
They've invested in more than 400 hardware startups that make accessories, and they're saying to these companies, we'll give you access to our supply chain, our 300 million customers, our retail channels. In exchange, we want our logo on your product, plus quite a lot of your profits. The best-selling air purifier in China is Xiaomi. The best-selling battery pack in China is Xiaomi. And it's a brilliant idea because it keeps the company in touch with what's happening on the streets. I asked the guys making these investment decisions, you're a hardware company, why don't you make these accessories yourself? You'll have more profit. And he said, nah, we'd have twice the number of staff in the company, so we'd never get a decision made. Plus, it's such a battle of survival in Shenzhen, in China, these guys have to know what the customer wants tomorrow, not yesterday. So we put him on the cover of Wired saying it's time to copy China. But it's not just companies that can be ecosystems. There's a country in the northeast of Europe with 1.3 million people called Estonia, which only got independence from the Soviets in 1991 and was very early in digitizing all aspects of government. They had no money to buy mainframe computers, so they used internet protocol. Everybody gets a digital passport. Every interaction with government is digital. So about four years ago, they thought, why do we need to limit our economy to people physically in the country? Why don't we create an ecosystem around Estonia, because we're digitally native, so that anybody outside Estonia can be part of the Estonian economy. They started something called e-residency. This is Kasper Korgis, who was running the project with his e-residency card. Anybody outside Estonia can apply online to become a digital resident, and you never need to go there. It's like 100 euros, a 20-minute set of questions, then you go and pick up your digital ID card in the local embassy. And it allows you to start a company in Estonia, in the Eurozone, it allows you to use Estonian services, such as accountancy, such as legal services, and it's a brilliant way of this tiny little country becoming internationally more relevant. So there are people from India, from Turkey, from Britain, who maybe the Indians find it hard to get PayPal accounts to trade on eBay. They're starting businesses through here. Casper then says, well, why don't we create a cryptocurrency so people can invest in our economy? So they're talking about doing this. It's quite controversial. The central bank doesn't really like that. But it's a fresh way of thinking of a country as a platform. He talks about Estonia being an app store on which other governments start to offer services to their digital residents. So it's no surprise that any company that's going to survive has to know what the customer needs. Um, but where innovation can be very exciting is when you see a need that is not being met, and then you go in in a fresh way. And that can be a need that governments, as well as other businesses, are not meeting. This is Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, who's an entrepreneur in Peru, which um, is a country that's been troubled Three decades of terrorism, hyperinflation, the emerging middle class is taking quite a long time to emerge. Um, it's been year after year the lowest of the OECD league table for educational attainment. Carlos runs a conglomerate that he started in 1995 called Intercorp, which is 4% of the GDP of Peru, 80,000 staff, $8 billion turnover. They have banks and supermarkets and pharmacies and cinemas. And he had a problem. He couldn't recruit good enough people for the company, and the customers were not getting rich enough to buy the better quality products they were making. And he thought the real problem is the government. It's not investing in education. There were 15 education ministers in the last 15 years. We're going to have to step in, he said. But we're going to have to do it in a fresh thinking way. We're going to have to do it in a way that makes money, but solves the problem. So he created a team to reinvent school for the digital age, online plus offline. They worked with IDEO, they worked with Stanford and Berkeley, and they thought, what should education be? It has to be low cost so that people in the lower middle class areas could go, but it has to be scalable 
And now they're going to Mexico, to Panama. They now have 52 of these schools called Innova schools. They're making money. They're getting twice the national attainment targets in the tests. And it's kind of transforming the culture of this bank-based conglomerate. And it's solving a real problem. They're now doing health clinics, low cost, for profit, doing what the government's not doing. The next project, internet connectivity in rural Peru, because the government has failed. It's given them a new sense of purpose. They have on their website now the new slogan, to make Peru their mission the best place in Latin America to raise a family. This is innovation. One of the ways to get new ideas flowing is to get different types of people coming together. And I don't just mean ethnically diverse, gender diverse. I mean thinking in diverse ways. So I went to spend some time at um, the moonshot factory that Google has called X, and they're obsessed with cognitive diversity. So you know, this moonshot factory has come up with some very valuable new businesses, the autonomous car company Waymo. They recently spun off um, a couple of companies. This one makes balloons that float in the stratosphere to send internet connectivity to parts of the world that don't get it. It's called Loon. This um, is one of their other businesses. It's called Wing, drone delivery. But they are constantly thinking how we can get really good people from different backgrounds, the physicist with the concert pianist, and allow them to knock together ideas, but also with what they call psychological safety, so that you're not embarrassed about saying something that will be maybe laughed at by other people. Kathy Hannon was um, the youngest employee working in marketing, and she had this obsession with low-carbon fuel. And she was thinking, could you take um, seawater and take the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide out of the seawater to combine them in a carbon-neutral fuel? And somebody at Xerox Park had published a paper suggesting this was possible. So she goes to the bosses and said, I'd like to try this. And at X, they make you um, use KPIs, use metrics, numbers the whole time to quantify where you are. And the first thing when you take on a project, you have to agree a kill criterion at which stage you will kill a project if it doesn't meet that number. And her kill criterion was, if we can prove the science, this fuel cannot be more expensive than petrol at the petrol station. So she started the project. They hired the guy who wrote the Xerox Park research paper. They started to prove the science. They made ethanol. It was $1,000 a gallon. It needed to be closer to five. But they took it down over two years to $100, $50, $13, $10. Then she goes to the boss and says, I want to kill the project because it's going to take longer and cost more to get to $5 and they all get a cash bonus for killing the project. Because we're human, we have biases, we think our project is the best. And they've come up with some things that didn't work as consumer products, and they've learned from a mistake like this, but this business alone is gonna be a hundred plus billion dollar business, I would think. Now we hear a lot, and we're gonna hear a lot over the next couple of days about Agile thinking, agile software development. Organizations need the ability to be agile because the startups are moving very quickly. Even organizations with three million employees and the biggest office building in the world. So they had a problem in the Pentagon and the American Department of Defense, which was so many of their big tech procurement projects are coming in years late, billions over budget, and are not what the soldiers in the front line need, because the enemy, ISIS, is a startup. ISIS takes a DJI drone, puts a grenade on it, sends it over enemy lines. How do you compete? They realized the Pentagon. They had to give space to a team of pirates, a little team of 40 people who didn't play by the bureaucracy's rules. They hired this guy, Chris Lynch, who swears a lot, 
He'd been in startups. He wears hoodies that say, hack the Pentagon. He was arrested and jailed when he was 17 for planting a bomb at school. And they said, go and recruit some people from tech on secondment, maybe one-year contracts, and get them to help solve the, the problems that the bureaucracy hasn't solved. One of the first projects they did was a bug bounty competition, pay friendly hackers to see if they can find vulnerabilities in the public facing defense websites. They were told at the beginning, this is illegal, you can't, government has never done this. They got lawyers to argue the case, they did it. It's now mandatory across American government, it works. Then they go to the front line in Middle Eastern countries where the bad guys are sending the drones over. They hack together a radio signal jammer with the soldiers on the front line to stop this, to solve this problem. Eventually, they earn their respect. They're on stage with the Secretary of Defense. They created a culture where they see themselves as the rebel alliance against this big monolith. Their name is Defense Digital Service, but even on their door, it says Rebel Alliance. I think every big organization needs space for a small rebel alliance that can just do stuff. I'll share a few wider, kind of obvious trends about innovation. So we know we're in a world of data, but it's how you use data to create transformation and new value. Um, this is an airline. Airlines have a really tough time because they don't control the price of fuel. They're competing with the low-cost carriers. The online travel agencies take over their profit. Qantas lost a few million Australian, a few billion Australian dollars earlier this um, decade. And then he thought, well, how are we going to survive? What do we have that's protectable? We have a loyalty program with a very, very personal relationship with half of the population of Australia. And the Qantas loyalty program, you buy and earn loyalty points in all sorts of purchases, from going to the bar to buying shoes. And they thought, well, people are sharing their behavior with us. They like hearing from us. Why don't we create a building at HQ next to Sydney Airport with 150 people prototyping new kind of business based on the data, based on people's behavior, on the loyalty program. They created a health insurance business, a life insurance business, a food and drink club, a golf club, credit cards, foreign currency cards. It's now, in the last year, 30% of the profits of the entire group because they've taken something that they had and made it protectable. We're at that moment where suddenly the offline world is online at scale. Um, in China, what if you could find out in real time what people across China were buying? In villages, not just in the big cities. So the Chinese post office got together with the richest man in Hong Kong, Li Kaixing, to do this. They're putting a million point-of-sale devices in village stores across China, little stores like this, so they can know, as people buy, what they're buying. So there's now a gigantic database. So if you are Chanel and you want to target people women aged 46 to 50 who have just bought Dior, you can know who they are and send them a little 20% discount voucher to their phone. Or even industrial companies that make factory machines and robots. This is a Swiss company called ABB, another 100-year-old company that's realized if you start to put sensors in your factory machines, you get this data layer and you can sell new services to your clients. You can charge them for things that you didn't realize you were selling them, how efficient my production line is when it needs to come to service. Because everything is now data. And I hate to say this in a Paris conference, but even fine wine is now data. Because there is a startup in San Francisco that is reverse engineering the molecular properties of wine and whiskey to recreate it without using grapes. Yeah, I knew this would upset you. It's these guys. <laughs> the company's called Endless West, and they have products on the market, and they are replicating because they think, you know, we're not going to be able to grow grapes soon, but we want to keep that price. Plus, why should Dom Perignon be expensive? Why should we not democratize it? I think if fine wine is a data problem to solve, then pretty much everything is. Um, I'll leave you a couple of other approaches that work. In your organization, can you find a way to look for things you're not looking for? 
Can you create a fund that doesn't have to make money in the short term, but is doing pure research, monitoring play, monitoring how people are behaving? Autodesk, the software company that became big 30 years ago when it came up with the design software AutoCAD, is not going to be relevant now, because that was the beginning of the desktop computer era, what happens in the cloud and the AI era. They, to their credit, invest quite a lot of money in looking at stuff that may be 10 years out. They have a pier in San Francisco full of robots and industrial machinery and 3D printers and artists on fellowships that are paid to be there. One of the things they noticed by playing about three years ago was if you work with the designer and get artificial intelligence helping them shape the product, they come up with constraints. I'm building an aeroplane seat. I want it to be this wide, this heavy, this material. And the AI provides thousands of versions of that in real time. It could actually be helpful. They called it generative design. They realized this could be the differentiator that gets us into the next era. Last year, they started releasing products with generative design. It's going to be transformative. It's going to be the next billion dollar lines because it was something they weren't looking for. How do you find things you're not looking for? Get different types of people coming together in ways that spark conversations. It can even be through the design of your building. So we've just in the last 18 months um, had this building in London that's the biggest biomedical research center in Europe, next to St. Pancras. It's called the Crick Institute. It's funded by the universities, the Wellcome Trust, the Cancer Research Charity, and it's trying to solve genomic illness because in the new world, it's no longer one department that will solve it. You need hybrid thinking. So they've designed it with no walls on the inside so that the bioinformatics expert will run into the data scientist, will run into the information visualizer. And it makes me remember why so many San Francisco entrepreneurs go every year to this city in the desert, Burning Man, for a week. 70, 80,000 people create new identities. It's a gift economy, a non-cash economy, a creative expression economy. And it's because you can prototype new ways of being and you can interact with different kinds of people. And I don't think for all the, you know, the creative expression that comes out, there's also new kind of business ideas. I don't think you'd get Airbnb without this, which is why I guess there's such a demand for co-working spaces, because it brings people together in ways that allow them to question their assumptions. Finally, guess what? There's new technology constantly emerging. It's how you embrace it, and whether you embrace it early and start experiment, experimenting with it, that determines whether you can get an advantage. And I'll just give you a couple of very kind of different examples of how old established organizations are innovating in a proper way using new tech in experimental ways. This is a barn in Napa Valley in California, which is home to a bunch of Michelin-starred chefs who go in there every day, make recipes, film the recipes, put them in an app, and they're paid for by a company you probably haven't heard of called Maya, which is based in Hong Kong, which is the second biggest manufacturer of saucepans in the world. Maya makes pots and pans. It was started by Stanley Cheng in the 1960s, and it became huge. And yet, Stanley's son, who's in his 30s, Vincent, says to his dad, Dad, you know the internet is coming for the kitchen as well. There's this thing called connected cooking happening we need to be there, otherwise we'll be irrelevant. Stanley lets him start a company inside Maya, which is the barn in Napa Valley. They hire these chefs. They get the chefs to make the recipes in the app that then talks to a new saucepan they're making, which has a temperature sensor embedded in the metal, so it can control very precisely the temperature as it's cooking along with the app for the exact number of seconds, which means you at home can cook like a Michelin-starred chef. And their model is you will subscribe to hundreds of recipes. You will maybe buy or even be given the saucepan. I said to Stanley, how big do you think this is going to be? He said, it's either going to be a billion-dollar business or zero. But if we don't try, 
will be zero. The other side of the world, in Norway, one of the biggest fertilizer manufacturers in the world had a problem of getting the fertilizer from the factory to the ports for export. It needed 40,000 trucks every year. It was polluting, expensive. They couldn't get drivers. They decided to solve this problem to invest $40 million making the world's first autonomous electric cargo ship. And they did a little demo about two years ago of a little prototype. Suddenly, lots of other companies in Norway are phoning them up saying, hey, we have the same problem. Could we pay you to use your cargo ship? They realized, actually, we seem to have made an innovation. We seem to have solved a problem and come up with something that people need. And I'll finally give you a um, phone company in Taiwan that has been in big trouble for the last few years, HTC. They see this technology called blockchain, and they think, I wonder if we could rethink what the phone is to stop us being a dying commodified phone company. Phil Chen, whose aunt started HTC, thought, if you could use the device to give somebody a place to keep their secure identity, not just for buying and selling Bitcoin, but for having an identity on this decentralized network that is definitely coming, maybe the network can pay you micropayments to give access to your processing power, your storage, the sensors in your phone. Maybe you'll earn $5 a month. They released the first version of the phone called the Exodus just before Christmas. It may not save HTC, but somebody is going to use this emerging technology first. I guess things are going to go wrong. You can innovate by accepting when it's gone wrong and solving the problem. I went to India, where a company called Wellspun that makes um, one in five towels and sheets sold in America, one of the biggest cotton manufacturers, was in trouble two years ago. A big American retailer, Target, announces the 100% Egyptian cotton high-quality towels that Wellspun made for them were not actually Egyptian cotton at all. They checked never dealing with them again, big lawsuits, company share price tanks. If it's going to survive, they realized they're going to have to own up to the problem, but also solve it. So they started a new project, tracking cotton from the field using RFID tags to the end customer, 17 stages. When you get your towel, you can scan the QR code to know exactly where your cotton had been. They realized Luxury good companies want to use this. They're paying them because the younger consumer now wants to know that there's been an authentic supply chain. They've hit upon a real solution. So I will leave you um, with the certainty that we're in denial about this change because we're human. Human biases are, Ooh, I'm not comfortable with this. This guy... Um, Bill Rimmer puts his mother in his Tesla and sets it to autonomous and films her reaction. I'm scared! Oh, there's cars coming! Oh! Oh, there's cars! Oh. Bill, just put me back for me control it! Oh, but you know, like, two or three months later, it's just going to be another way to go to the supermarket. Um, so you are irrational. And I'm sorry. I'm going to have to make you reflect. You need to overcome these fears. Somebody posted on Reddit a couple of years ago um, an interesting question. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly appeared, what would be the hardest thing to explain about modern life? And my favorite answer was, I have a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and to get into arguments <laughs> with strangers. I celebrate your irrationality. Thank you.